29% of the bones at this Jurassic graveyard are scarred with bite marks. That is six times higher than anywhere else. The bites are not random. They match the teeth of Allosaurus, attacking not just herbivores, but their own kind. This fossil record does not show a monster losing control. It reveals a predator adapting to disaster, turning cannibalism into a survival edge when every other strategy failed. How did eating their fallen make Allosaurus unstoppable? The bones force us to reconsider everything we thought we knew about prehistoric dominance. 2,368 fossil bones. That is the scale of the Migat Moor Quarry record. 40 years of digging, cataloging, and measuring every scrap that surfaced from the ancient floodplain. Each fossil was examined for surface scars, and the results left no room for doubt. 684 bones, nearly a third of the entire collection, bear the unmistakable signature of theropod feeding. This is not a matter of a few dramatic specimens. It is a data set large enough to demand statistical treatment, transforming scattered clues into a forensic pattern. Bite marks at Mygat Moor are not just tallied, they are classified. Researchers sorted them into five distinct types, punctures, scores, furrows, pits, and striations. Each tells its own story about how tooth met bone. Punctures, deep forceful impacts, suggest powerful targeted bites. Scores and furrows track the drag of serrated teeth across hard surfaces, sometimes parallel, sometimes intersecting. Pits mark the spots where teeth pressed but did not break through. Most revealing of all are the striated impressions, fine parallel lines carved by the serrated edges of theropod teeth. Their spacing and depth matching the denticles of Allosaurus, the site's most common predator. The spectrum of mark sizes is just as revealing. The largest bite impressions reach over 28 millimeters in length, while the smallest measure less than 2 millimeters. That range is evidence that both adult and juvenile animals, or a range of species, left their mark on the bones. By measuring the spacing of these striations, paleontologists can estimate the size and even the likely identity of the biter with surprising accuracy. In some cases, the marks point directly to Allosaurus. In others, they hint at Ceratosaurus, or at an even larger, rarer carnivore. With so many bones and such a detailed classification system, the Mygat Moor record stands apart from typical dinosaur sites. Here, the bite marks are not scattered curiosities. They are a pervasive feature mapped and measured in a way that turns isolated incidents into a robust signal. This forensic approach allows researchers to move beyond speculation, laying a solid foundation for tracking exactly who was eating whom, and how often, in the harsh world of the late Jurassic. 17% of the bite marks at Mygat Moor appear on theropod bones. That is not a random accident or a predator testing unfamiliar meat. It is carnivores feeding on their own kind. The evidence sits right on the bones, deep scores and striations on femurs, toes, and vertebrae that match the serrated teeth of Allosaurus. When paleontologists mapped which bones bore the most marks, a pattern emerged. Nearly half of all bites landed on so-called low economy elements, bones with little meat, like digits and tail vertebrae. These are not prime cuts, they are scraps the leftovers after every edible bit has been stripped away. Stephanie Drumheller and her team matched the fine parallel grooves in bone to the spacing of denticles on Allosaurus teeth. The forensic match is precise enough to rule out most other predators at the site. Ceratosaurus, present but rare in the quarry, leaves a different mark, smoother and less striated, and it is less common in the overall sample. The numbers do not lie. Allosaurus was both the main diner and the main dish. The targeting of low-value bones is not the behavior of a well-fed predator. It is the signature of a population picking over carcasses long after the best parts are gone. In modern forensic terms, this is late-stage scavenging, feeding that happens when resources are depleted and competition is fierce. The fact that so many of these marks appear on other theropods, not just herbivores, points to a community under stress. Cannibalism here is not a rare event or a last resort for the desperate few. It is a recurring strategy, 
written across hundreds of bones and decades of excavation. The Mygat Moor Quarry does not just record who ate whom. It documents a survival tactic that rewrote the rules of Jurassic life. Charcoal bands thread through the ancient mudstone at Mygat Moor, black streaks left by wildfires that swept the Jurassic floodplain. These are not isolated traces. Layer after layer, the sediment records repeated burns, each one a sign of parched vegetation and a drying landscape. The Morrison Formation, once a patchwork of lush river channels and fern meadows, began to wither under cycles of drought. Oxygen isotope ratios in fossilized bones, tiny imprints of ancient rainfall, shift toward values that signal water stress. Even the mineral makeup of the clay tells the same story. Increased weathering, less rainfall, soils that baked and cracked in the sun. Wildfires did not just scorch the earth. They stripped away ground cover, exposing bare soil to the wind and sun, accelerating the loss of what little moisture remained. Fossil wood preserved as carbonized fragments speaks to the intensity of these blazes. Charcoal deposits build up in the same layers as the dinosaur bones, tying the fate of the animals to the fate of the plants. Every drought meant less forage for the giant sauropods, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, who formed the backbone of the ecosystem. When the rains failed, their numbers crashed. Water holes shrank, herds thinned, and carcasses became more common than living giants. The sediment itself acts as a climate diary. Bands of lighter and darker mud alternate, marking wet and dry spells. During the driest intervals, the floodplain became a trap. Animals drawn to the last muddy pools left behind footprints that hardened and fossilized. Bones accumulated, sometimes exposed for months, sometimes buried quickly by the next flash flood. The story written in these rocks is not one of steady abundance, but of boom and bust, cycles where life hung on the edge of collapse. The droughts did not just reshape the landscape, they set the stage for everything that followed, including the desperate measures taken by the predators left behind. Predators at Mygat Moor Quarry were not just hungry, they were crowded, and the ecosystem showed a clear imbalance. Fossil counts reveal a stark fact Carnivores outnumbered their herbivore prey by a wide margin. Allosaurus dominated the scene, but it was not alone. Ceratosaurus, though less common, and the occasional giant like Torvosaurus all competed for the same shrinking pool of resources. In a world where every carcass mattered, competition was fierce and unforgiving. The clearest measure of that pressure comes from comparing Megat Moore to its neighbor, Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. Both sites sit within the Morrison Formation, both date to the late Jurassic, and both preserve the remains of large theropods and sauropods. But at Cleveland, Lloyd only 4% of bones show evidence of bite marks, a figure that matches the global average for dinosaur bone beds. Mygat Moore's 29% stands in stark relief, a statistical outlier that demands explanation. This difference is not just about numbers, it is about behavior. At Cleveland, Lloyd, a typical carcass might be picked over quickly, buried by the next flood, and forgotten by the living. But at Mygat Moor, bones lingered on the surface for weeks or months. The slow pace of burial meant every dead animal became a resource to be revisited, stripped, and gnawed by waves of hungry mouths. The longer a bone stayed exposed, the more likely it was to collect overlapping bite marks from multiple scavengers. With too many predators and not enough prey, the rules of the hunt broke down. Allosaurus and its rivals could not afford to wait for the next fresh kill. Instead, they circled the same carcasses, scraping even the smallest scraps from bone. The high density of carnivores, the extended exposure of remains, and the relentless competition created a perfect storm one that left a forensic record of desperation and adaptation etched into the fossil bone. In this crowded guild, survival meant taking whatever protein you could find, even if it came from a rival or sometimes your own kind. Allosaurus ruled the feeding ladder at Mygatat Moor, not because it was the biggest brawler, but because it could extract value from a carcass long after others had given up. In the late Jurassic, every meal was a contest of anatomy and persistence. The best cuts, viscera, thigh meat, 
and limb muscle went fast, stripped by the first arrivals or the strongest jaws. But as the easy calories vanished, the real test began. Who could make use of what was left? Marrow was the final prize. Locked inside dense bones, it offered a concentrated dose of fat and protein, sometimes the difference between survival and starvation. Allosaurus had the toolkit for the job. Its teeth, tall and serrated like steak knives, did not just slice flesh. They could gouge, puncture, and score bone. Each bite left a signature, a deep puncture, or a fine parallel striation, evidence of a predator determined to reach the last reserves. Modern studies estimate that marrow from large dinosaur bones could provide thousands of calories per kilogram, a lifeline in lean times. The feeding hierarchy at Mygat Moor played out in stages. First, the carcass drew in every carnivore within range. Allosaurus, with its speed and numbers, usually arrived first. Ceratosaurus and the rare Torvosaurus might circle the edges, waiting for scraps. As the feast wore on, the pickings got leaner. Fingers, toes, and vertebrae, bones with little meat, became targets. Allosaurus's jaw mechanics, built for rapid, forceful bites, allowed it to wedge open joints and crack into shafts. Its bite force, estimated at up to 3,500 newtons, was not record-breaking, but it was enough to breach the defenses of even the toughest bones. This anatomical edge meant Allosaurus could exploit resources that competitors could not. Where others might walk away or starve, it stayed behind, gnawing at digits and prying open marrow cavities. The fossil record at Mygatet Moor preserves this hierarchy in scars, deep grooves on toe bones, crushed vertebral spines, and the telltale striations of serrated teeth. Survival here was measured not by brute strength, but by the ability to turn scraps into sustenance. When the environment offered nothing but leftovers, Allosaurus did not just endure, it thrived. Ceratosaurus stalked the same floodplains as Allosaurus, but its advantages faded when the ecosystem turned hostile. Its teeth, robust but less sharply serrated, excelled at puncturing and holding flesh, not slicing through bone. In times of plenty, that was enough. Fresh kills, soft tissue, and little need to gnaw on leftovers. But as droughts dragged on and herbivore carcasses became rare, Ceratosaurus met its limits. The jaws that could clamp down on prey struggled to pry open marrow-rich bones. Its feeding style, tuned for the quick reward of fresh meat, offered no answer for the long, lean months when only scraps remained. Torvosaurus, even larger and more powerful, faced a different challenge. Its heavy skull and thick teeth could crush bone, but it was a rare visitor at Mygat Moor. Fossil counts show that Torvosaurus barely registered compared to the swarms of Allosaurus. The reasons are written in the quarry's numbers. In a crowded guild where every carcass counted, specialization became a liability. Torvosaurus may have been a formidable hunter, but its rarity suggests it could not compete for the dwindling resources or adapt to a scavenger life on the margins. Allosaurus, by contrast, thrived on flexibility. Its ziphodont teeth, shaped for slicing and scoring, let it harvest value from even the toughest, least desirable bones. When the best cuts disappeared, Allosaurus stayed behind, working digits, vertebrae, and marrow cavities that others overlooked. The longer a carcass lay exposed, the more bite marks accumulated, often layered and overlapping, as Allosaurus returned again and again. Ceratosaurus and Torvosaurus, constrained by their feeding tools and habits, left or starved. Allosaurus endured. The outcome is preserved in the quarry's record, a landscape dominated by one adaptable predator. Its rivals outnumbered and outlasted. The fossil evidence does not just count winners and losers. It explains why. In a world where opportunity meant survival, the least selective diner became the last one standing. For decades, the textbook example of dinosaur cannibalism rested on a handful of Colophesis skeletons from Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. In the late 1980s, paleontologist Edwin Colbert described juvenile bones found inside the rib cages of adult Colophesis, and he declared it a case of adults eating their young. The story stuck, 
It was repeated in museum labels and in documentaries until the American Museum of Natural History took a closer look. A re-examination in the early 2000s found that the supposed stomach contents were actually bones from unrelated animals, mixed in during burial or shifted by water currents long after death. There were no tooth marks and no signs of digestion, just misplaced bones. The evidence did not hold up. This reversal was not just an academic footnote. It exposed the limits of relying on where bones end up, rather than how they were marked or modified. Positional association, it turned out, can be misleading. In contrast, the MyGat Moore data is built on direct traces. 684 bones bear feeding marks that can be measured, matched, and statistically tested. Where the Colophysis claim faded under scrutiny, the Allosaurus evidence stands on the strength of physical, repeatable signs left in the fossil record. Science does not cling to old stories when the evidence shifts. It updates the record, one bone at a time. Cannibalism is not just a relic of the Jurassic. Across the animal kingdom, it is a tool for survival, especially when resources run thin. Komodo dragons, the world's largest living lizards, regularly eat their own kind. Studies estimate that about 10% of a Komodo's diet comes from smaller or younger Komodos. Hatchlings even spend their first years in the trees to avoid being eaten by adults. In the Arctic, polar bears have turned to cannibalism as sea ice shrinks, and their main prey, seals, become harder to catch. Sightings and documented cases have increased as climate stress intensifies. Crocodiles, too, will eat juveniles during droughts, when shrinking waterholes trap both prey and kin in close quarters. These are not isolated incidents or signs of madness. They are natural responses to environmental pressure. When food runs low, the animals that survive are the ones willing to see an opportunity where others see a taboo. Nature rewards flexibility not squeamishness. Adaptation still decides who survives. When scarcity hits, nature rewards the species willing to cross lines others fear. Fossil evidence shows Allosaurus thrived because it didn't flinch from cannibalism, a trait echoed in today's most resilient predators. As modern ecosystems strain under climate change, the lesson endures. Survival rarely favors the most noble, but the most unyielding. What boundaries would we cross when survival is on the line? 